Hey everyone, just wanted to hop on here real quick and let you all know of a great event that I'm going to be a part of, as well as many previous guests on this show. So on Sunday, May 29th, I will be participating in the WAP Stripathon. And if you're thinking wet ass pussy, yes and no, um, it's going to be a charity stripathon happening at the legendary Penthouse Strip Club and will be benefiting the Wish Drop In Center, which is a nonprofit organization based in Vancouver that benefits street-based sex trade workers. Tickets are $20 or $30 at the door and all proceeds, including stage tips, cover charges, all that. Everything is going to charity. We hope this event will sell out, so we hope to see you there. So for more information, follow us on Instagram at stripathon2022. Welcome back to another episode of Strip by Sia, your podcast for strippers, sex workers, and all the fancy naked people in between. I am your host, Steph Sia, aka Kimchi on stage. You will not see me for a little bit. Actually, by the time this comes out, you might actually see me in a couple weeks at the penthouse in Vancouver, Canada. Um, but I am the host of the show. It's me every single week, plus a really cool guest that is way, way, way cooler than me. And this week is no exception. But before we get into all the fun and juicy stuff, because today we're talking all about TikTok, talking about camming, talking about some super exciting things that our guest today, Emily Jones, is going to want to announce. But yes, before we get into all that stuff, I just want to say thank you and a shout out to all the fans and also people on Patreon, people on my top tier who are subscribing. Um, hello to Justin Erickson. We have a Rip Sarkar, Stefan Chex, and we also have Jay Sunser. And thank you so much for being on the top tier. There's also other tiers that you can check out for as low as $4 US, which is the price of a really nice oat milk latte or something like that. I mean, that's my usually my order. Um, that's what I usually like. But um, it's your way of showing support and helping the show out since so many of you have been asking over the past four seasons, how can I help? This is how you can help and will help me get a better mic and a better setup because with a high ceiling in my townhouse, it's not really good for sound, but you're all still listening here every week. So thank you so much. Um, for those who are just popping into the show, I am a sex worker myself. I am a stripper, as I mentioned earlier. I am a digital content creator as well as a former sugar baby, and I bring on different guests every single week on the show to help destigmatize sex work through education, through their lived experiences, because people need to know the real lives of sex workers, and usually it's kind of boring, to be honest. <laughs> like, we're just normal people. It's just a job. But I think it's really special and also really important to tell the stories of like what we actually do from the source, not just someone on the news or in tabloids saying this is how it's like, because usually that stuff's really exaggerated. So that's just a little background. Um, I know our guest today is patiently waiting and she's being so polite and just smiling at the camera. And again, if you're not on Patreon, it's patreon.com slash strip I see it. That's like where you'll see the exclusive video content. She is super cute and I am so excited to introduce her onto the show. Hello to cam girl and TikToker, Emily Jones. <laughs> Hi! Hello! <laughs> Welcome. I felt like I was like a sports like teleprompter person. Emily Jones! Coming to the stage! <laughs> exactly. I don't know why I went on that. It's way too early for me to be talking like that, but hello and welcome! <laughs> Hi! I'm so excited to be here! Hi! Super stoked to have you. I am so excited to chat about all the things today. Uh, I know I introduced you as a cam girl and a TikToker, but did I get it wrong? How did I do? I mean, I'd love for you to tell us, the, tell the audience who you are and what it is you do on your own terms. Yeah, I'm Emily Jones. I'm a cam girl. Uh, and from wiki articles, I'm also apparently a TikToker. Um, I just kind of do TikTok in my free time, but I am happy to take the title. 
So (laughs) you're so welcome. And like, it's, I think it's really cool because like, I know a lot of people are really, really excited for this episode. A lot of people are like, oh my God, TikTok, it's such a a big rage right now. I personally don't use it. I've tried to on two different occasions. And I was just like, I suck at this. Plus it's so time consuming. (laughs) But yeah. yeah. Yeah, and we'll definitely get into all those details later. Just a look on your face like, yes, it is. It's a full-time job. (laughs) But I would love for you, maybe we can start right at the beginning in terms of like how you got into sex work. Like what was your first experiences? What is your story? The audience would love to know. Yeah, um, when I was about 19 – I had money problems. I had actually moved out of my parents' house at 18. So like as soon as I turned 18, I was like, I'm done. I'm out. So I left my parents' house and I was kind of couch surfing on a family member's um, apartment in like Utah. And I was there and one of my friends was like, hey, if you want some money to be able to get like your own place and stuff. I just started this cool thing. It's called cam work. And I was like, what is that? And she was like, it's this thing called cam soda. And you go on and you like just talk to people. And she made it seem like it was basically like a podcast or something. And I was like, okay, sure. So I went on there for the first time and realized that it was completely different. And then I actually fell in love with it immediately. I was like, wow, this is actually really cool. Even though it's like naked, it's still really fun. (laughs) So, um... I've ended up doing that for like two years. It'll be three years in June. And yeah, it's just been awesome. It has been so cool being a cam girl, you know, and it really did afford me like the independence that I always wanted. And I was able to move out of my family, um, my family member's apartment that same year. So like that was in like 20, like 19. And I was able to move out and I actually moved to States. Wow. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Okay. Hang on. Hang on. Let's back it up. I have so many questions already. So first of all, congratulations. That's a huge accomplishment and that's amazing. Like amazing. Amazing. So, so proud of you. (laughs) But (laughs) you mentioned you were streaming on Cam Soda. I've never actually heard of that one before. Yeah. So Cam Soda is like up there with like some of the big ones. Um, I started on there. I was on there for like maybe a day or two. And then I Googled what are the biggest cam sites. And then I ended up finding Chatterbait. And that's the one that I've been using ever since. Mm -hmm. How did you decide? Because I know there's like a lot of, well, some people on the show have been team my free cam some people have been team chatterbait how do you like when you're deciding which website you want to go when you're doing the research what is important to you and what are you like looking for that will I don't know I guess benefit you and what would be your deciding factor over one site over the other I really looked at when I was first joining how many users were using the platform and how exclusive it was. So I actually for a long time was debating between Chatterbait and um, Live Jasmine. But when I saw Live Jasmine, I noticed that it almost presented itself as like a more elite kind of model. And I was so nervous to join because I was like, well, I'm just starting. I have no idea what I'm doing. And Chatterbait actually presented on Google that they had more users. So I was like, okay, I'm going to go with more users because the more people that will come into my room, the more chances I'll have of somebody, anybody tipping me. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. And I, again, I've never heard of Live Jasmine. This is, I feel like, uh, again, I'm constantly learning on the show. I'm like, what? There's so many. Never heard of Prime Soda. Never heard of Live Jasmine. But that's cool. That's cool to see that there's like other ones that are coming out here, especially in the world recently and different styles I guess in terms of like who they're catering to so you mentioned live jasmine is more of like or at least it presented itself as more of like higher end as opposed to chatter rate which is maybe like more girl next door maybe maybe something you resonated a bit more too but also because the volume was there which I think is really really smart 
how was your first experience camming? Like, I know your friend was just like, oh, yeah, it's just something. It's super fun. Like, <laughs> how did it go for you? Was any of it shocking to you at all? Or did you kind of have a pretty good understanding of what it was? I had absolutely no idea what I was getting into. Um, I was so scared. I literally, my first day, I went on for about 10 minutes because I logged on and then I saw these chat like bubbles popping up of people who were like interacting with me and they were immediately like, get naked, show me your tits. And I was just like, oh my God, I don't know what, huh? And then I logged off and I just, <laughs> I didn't know what to do. <laughs> Peace. <laughs> That's just nice. Bye. <laughs> yeah, I was so scared. And like, but honestly, the only way that I learned was because every time I went on, somebody would be like, hey, have you tried this yet? And I was like, what is that? And then they would explain it to me. And so that's how I like eventually learned how to do everything. Mm, right. Yes. I mean, talking about my, my brief two week stint of camming, it was always helpful when those people came into your room to help out and stuff. Um, we, were these just uh, viewers that were coming into your room that were like, hey, I noticed you're new here. Can you help? Like, have you considered using this? Yeah, pretty much. It was just new users who were coming in and was like, hey, I want to see you do this. And I was like, I don't know how to do that. So if you want to see me do that, you're going to have to teach me, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. Did you ever have um, – because you were new, like talking about like when you first started on, did you ever have – guests coming in um, because they noticed that you were new trying to take advantage of you at all in terms of like, well, let me help you out here. And then they expect like a free show from you. Absolutely. Every single day, all the time. <laughs> because, um, you know, as soon as they see a young girl doing something for the first time, they immediately are like, well, I'm going to take this opportunity to get exactly what I want no matter if it is a detriment to this person. So I really had, it was a really good experience to learn how to say no, you know? Cause like as a young girl, you're always nervous to say no, like to things immediately. So it was a really like great learning experience for like being able to tell somebody no and to F off, like it was nothing, you know? Yeah. Like, were you already, like, are you already kind of like right off the bat like that? Like you already knew your boundaries already when you started camming or was it something you, you had to really learn how to do? Cause like, again, with me and my own experience, like I always try to be really nice and, and I always want to please people. And I had, that's definitely a, to a fault for sure. But how do you, how did you establish that firm? Like, no, I'm not going to do that. Fuck off. <laughs> Yeah. Um, at first I kind of knew, like I was nervous. So a lot of the like no's that I would say to things was just me being nervous of like, I don't want to get naked. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do that. Um, and then from there, it was kind of like a fluctuating learning curve where it was like, well, okay, I'm okay with like getting naked, but I don't want to use toys or I don't want to do this. And then as I became more comfortable with navigating it, I realized, okay, well, I am okay with these things, but then these are hard no's. And as your career goes longer and longer, sometimes those things change. You know, sometimes you end up stopping something that you used to do in favor for something new that you want to try or a different type of toy that you want to use, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, totally. And you're allowed to change. That's just, this is how you grow. Like, I think it's really, really important, um, like, in terms of, like, artistry, because I, I feel like there's artistry in sex work for sure. But, like, did you ever have fans that were maybe upset that you weren't using certain toys anymore or you weren't doing certain acts anymore? How did you deal with that? Yeah, I definitely had people who, as I changed in my career, kind of backed off or got agitated that I wasn't doing certain things anymore. But after a while of like trying to please those certain people, I realized that as you move on and as you decide what you want to do, if people aren't okay with that or if they want to continue to see that kind of thing, um, there's always other places that they can go. 
you know, you shouldn't have to do things that you don't want to do just because a fan of yours wants to see it. Um, I always try to remember that, like, I want to give my fans what they want, but not the detriment of what I want to do. Right. Yeah. That's really important too. Cause I, again, going back to that whole people pleasing mentality, which like a lot of us can suffer from, um, doesn't apply to all of us, but especially like when you're first starting out, because you want to make fans, you want to build that following. And sometimes like, and this goes with not just camming, but with a lot of like a lot of sex work, trying to have a catch all kind of business model in terms of like, well, I'm not sure if I really like to do this, but if I do everything, if I offer everything in this service and that service, then I'll catch more people. Like, and I think a lot of us sex workers fall into that trap a lot. Um, do you have anything to elaborate or share on that? Like, you're smiling a little bit there. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, that's a hundred percent on the money, but I've, I've learned that a lot of guys who enjoy this kind of thing really enjoy when you set boundaries, like men really respect when women have like set boundaries or set things that they say, um, the more like empowered you are in yourself, the more attractive you become to the men who come to see you. So if you're ever like, you know, on the fence about something, just go with your gut and then stick to it because more people will end up liking that about you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's definitely, definitely well said for sure. Um, yeah, we, I think we just, I mean, it's part of the journey too. Like we're not always going to know that right off the bat. And if you are one of those people, like kudos to you, <laughs> kudos yeah. to you for having a backbone like that. <laughs> 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 well, going along with video content, obviously with the rise of video content, you know, um, we've seen the evolution in terms of social media, you know, with it went with Facebook and then we have Instagram with just pictures and that started to go to videos. Then we're going to TikTok, which obviously has exploded in the past few years for sure. So, and I'm assuming that everyone knows what TikTok is, but for those who don't know what TikTok is, it's a social media app um, that allows you to make, um, it's like a, a video editing app that you can make these little videos and you can now collaborate with other people on it. And it's super popular. It's just a continuous scroll on your phone all the time. And I've seen it being used in many, many different ways. Um, obviously a lot for entertainment, but we'll get more into some of the other uses too um, later on. But I just wanted to maybe start talking about the talk <laughs> in, terms of t in terms of TikTok. Um, tell us about how you started and your journey with this app. Yeah, so the very first TikTok that I made was actually – paid for by Chatterbait. Um, <laughs> they were doing a campaign where they were like trying to like be popular on TikTok. And it was like one of those, tell me that you work on Chatterbait without telling me that you work on Chatterbait. <laughs> I think I saw this. <laughs> yeah. And they were doing that campaign for a while and they were like, hey, well, we'll pay you like 50 bucks to do a TikTok. And I was like, hell yeah. So I made a TikTok account. I did it. And then it actually got really popular. So I was like, okay, well, I'll just do more. So I actually recreated the video a few times and then it kept getting popular. So I was just like, okay, this is just what I'm going to do in my free time now. And then that's how it kind of like evolved. Oh my gosh. Amazing. And like, I've seen, I guess I probably say, saw an iteration of that video because it was really funny. Um, but um, yeah, I guess TikTok can be intimidating for some people maybe you're overwhelming for some people D how did you did you even know what tiktok was like i'm sure you knew what tiktok was but like did you know how to use it like how was like the learning curve for you for that because obviously it's different than camming yeah um i had absolutely no idea like most things that i do in my life <laughs> absolutely no idea what i'm doing <laughs> ever um so <laughs> when i joined tiktok i had no idea um, and then it was 
pretty much through just having the app and kind of scrolling through and watching videos like 24 seven because it's so addicting, yes. you know? Yes, it is. <laughs> yeah. So after like watching TikToks for so long, I was like, oh, I kind of get it now. Like if you use a popular audio, you'll be able to have a popular video and stuff like that, you know? Yeah, yeah, I'd love to for you to talk about some of the hacks in a little bit or or maybe yeah, I guess we'll we'll talk about it now in terms of like okay, if you're really breaking down like your process for making a TikTok video, like where do you start? Obviously, you have to make a video of some sort, a video or a sequence of videos, but tell us about like your process. Yeah. So, um, the very first thing that I do, um, is actually while I'm scrolling through TikTok, if I see a sound that's like popular, or if I see a sound that I know I can make a TikTok off of, I'll make sure to add it to my favorites so that it's super easy to find. Um, same thing with like filters or anything that's really popular on there. First thing I do is save it. And then when I actually go to create a video, I go into my saved filters and my saved sounds. And then I can remember like, oh, I saved the sound because I saw this video or, oh, because I wanted to try this trend. Um, A lot of what I've seen for like cam girls or sex workers is dancing videos um, because you can get away with wearing like pretty much anything as long as like your bits are covered yeah you can wear like anything and you can do a dance tiktok so (laughs) i see this a lot yeah for sure i think like where tiktok really exploded i feel like it really exploded in 2020 during the pandemic and everyone and their dog and their mom the grandma and their friend down the street and their neighbor (laughs) we're doing dancing tiktoks like i feel like that is how at least in my memory how it exploded But I guess, and I know that you do some dancing videos too, as well. (laughs) Yeah. Yes. (laughs) Do you have to be a skilled dancer to be on TikTok? Because the the videos that I see are like crazy. (laughs) Yeah. Some, I literally, I did a, um, I did like a 48 hour cam stream at one point in my career. And I, during that time was trying to learn the renegade from like those TikTok videos. It took me seven hours just to learn the Renegade. I am such a bad dancer. (laughs) So you do not have to be a good dancer. Um, I literally just go for like the easiest dances I can find. And then I just do that like a hundred times over on my channel. Yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot. I feel like when I'm hearing from your process, you are trying to pick up what is or whatever is trending, whether it's audio, whether it's filters, whether it's dances, whether it's some kind of trendy thing on there. Um, I think that's really, really smart and strategic to do because obviously whatever is trending usually gets um, more views overall, right? Is that kind of your strategy? Yeah, pretty much. Um, Whenever, because I mean, TikTok basically just goes through the algorithm. So whatever is the most trending music or whatever music TikTok is trying to push at that moment is usually like the best audio to use. Um, Same thing with the filters, like most of the filters that are created are um, created by other users. And so both with the audios and with the filters, people will kind of pay other TikTokers to make them trendy. So when you jump on that trend, it becomes shared more through that kind of group, which then ends up making your video more popular. So the more that you do that, the more popular your videos become and then your channel becomes popular. There we go. Yeah, that's definitely really key. Um, I know that with a lot of platforms like YouTube, like Instagram and obviously TikTok too, there's always that algorithm. And a lot of people are always trying to see if they can like find out what it is and try to beat it. But is is this how is this how you think that the algorithm is operating? I would say that for the TikTok algorithm itself, it really is able to be manipulated in a lot of different ways. Okay. Yeah. Go into that. Um, 
So I've seen, like, I see a lot of music artists where they create music, like Little Nas X. He started his career off of TikTok. Yes. He yes. made a song, and then what he did was he paid, like, 100 people to do a dance to it. And then through that, it more and more people wanted to jump on this trend. It started to become popular until everybody was using his sound. And then I see new people who are trying to get into the music industry recreating that. Mm -hmm. So whenever you see like something trending, it's more about kind of being in the middle. Like you don't have to be the very first one to do it. But if you're doing it too late, like if you've noticed this trend for like three or four months, yeah, then you probably want to get on to it right away. Because if you do it too late, then nobody's going to really care because they've seen it a thousand million times already. Right, right. No, that makes sense. I mean, I guess it's key to be, I guess, say like an early adopter rather than late. Yeah, too late, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the earlier you can do it, the better. Um, but of course, the more people that are doing the trend in the moment, the better your chances are going to be to show up on somebody else's feed. Right, yeah, because I know a lot of people are always trying to, you know, the, the thing that they're always concerned about is discoverability. And people want to pop up on that FYP, like for your page, page, I guess, which is like this the I guess this on a parallel with like the home page on like Instagram. <laughs> Can you tell yeah. me I don't use TikTok? <laughs> I'm just like uh, I know like the surface level of TikTok, but yeah, I guess like because I feel like when people start on TikTok, or maybe this is coming from my own experience, like we want to make videos because they're fun, but we're not using it in a way that is like business minded and business focused. Right. Um, Because a a lot of people are just trying to rely on the virality of a video, which isn't a good strategy. Yeah, exactly. The more businesses that I see on TikTok, um, they try to come off as a person, you know, like that's a business's biggest selling point is that they can come off as human to you so that you relate to that product. So the good thing about you being an actual human being is that you can just do whatever you want on there and people will pretty much relate to it. Um, So like I'll see companies go on there um, and they just do like wild shit. Like they will literally get on there and do the weirdest TikTok possible because they know it'll, you know, get views. And then um, as far as like regular people go, you can pretty much just do whatever regular people are doing at that moment and you're fine. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, you kind of hit on the nail Nail the head, bleh, nail on the head. Wow, my brain is not on today. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, in, ter- in terms of talking about businesses and the, the the importance of like humanization, people want to understand and feel like they're interacting with the human, and there's like actually like, someone behind that. And of course, there is always like a team behind like making these insane TikTok videos um, as a way to like market to their customers. Um, as we shift the focus over to sex work and TikTok, how can sex workers use or utilize TikTok in a way that can help, you know, bring people back to either their website or their OnlyFans or subscription sites or say to your stream? How does that work? Because it's always such a tricky, like fine line because we don't want to get deplatformed. Yeah, exactly. Um, My first bit of advice is to always be covered up. Um, The easiest way to get banned or suspended on TikTok is to like not have straps or not have clothes on. And like if you're like pretending to be naked or something, um, it'll pretty much automatically get flagged and you'll get banned or suspended. Um, I also I follow a lot of other cam models and strippers and sex workers on TikTok to kind of see what they're doing. And something that I've noticed is that a lot of the videos that specifically say something about what you do for work don't get as many views as, like, you just alluding to it. Right. Like, if I see, like, um, a stripper talk, then 
when they're like talking about being a stripper, that kind of gets less views than if they just like have a wad of cash or if they're just like washing their money for the night or if they're like counting it out in front of the camera. That kind of stuff gets people's attention way more. Oh, so rather than like in your face, like I'm going to be talking about this explicitly, um, yeah, more of the um, alluding to or yeah, like tell me your stripper – but not tell me you're a stripper kind of thing. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) That's really interesting. Like what other trends have you noticed about like what other sex burgers are doing with their TikTok, TikTok streams? Oh my God. I don't even know what to call it. I'm still, I'm still (laughs) irrelevant. (laughs) I'm only 32, but I feel like TikTok is like (laughs) not in my generation. (laughs) It's a young man's game. I totally understand. (laughs) <laughs> so sad. Yeah, um <laughs> uh other like trends I guess I've noticed is um I see a lot of girls who pretty much make their like entire TikTok feed either about their cam room or about like them being sexy. Mm. And I've noticed on TikTok in particular that the more that you stray away from that, the better. So instead of like showing people like, hey, I'm sexy immediately. um, If you do like a few TikToks that like kind of allude to it, like, oh, I'm going to wear a push-up bra on this like crop top and I'm going to do a dumb little dance. Then that usually goes better with people. I have no idea why. Wow. Okay. That's like really shocking to me because you you would think that like sex sells and people would want to push that aesthetic more than like silliness. But I think I, – I, and that's one thing I really, really admire about TikTok is just embracing the goofy, embracing the silliness, embracing like kind of like girl next door-ish kind of like mentality over than just like I'm so hot. Come watch my yeah. TikTok. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. There are some girls who are able to just like get on there and lip sync in like a really tight dress and they'll get a lot of views. But a lot of the time, it's just you having like a personality or you doing something that makes you relatable to other people. Yeah. Even if it's just doing a dumb dance, you know, that in other people's mind makes you relatable because it's like, yeah, I've done that dance. I know how dumb it is to feel in front of your camera when I do that, but you make it look good. You know? Yeah. I guess it's like just alluding more to like the realness and like trying to get to know someone a bit better and like more on a personal level as opposed to just like surface level is kind of what I'm understanding from that. Yeah. A lot of the um like I don't know if you've ever seen like Melrose Michaels, mm-hmm. but yeah. A lot of these girls who end up having like large platforms on like multiple like levels is because they'll diversify themselves so much from their work. Like their Instagram will be all about their gaming channel. And then their TikTok will be like all about their makeup tutorials. And then, you know, so it's like different aspects of your personality that you showcase on social media platforms. That's really interesting because like I feel like sometimes we want to keep going into our niche And just being pigeonholed into our niche, or at least maybe that's what we've been taught for so long. But I guess maybe a way to get to get across to more people and to diversify our audiences is to not have different personalities. But as you mentioned, different parts of our personality traits or different interests dedicated to each platform. (laughs) Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's really fascinating. I never even thought about that at all. That's really, really cool. And I think that's a cool strategy too because I feel like you can reach more people that way. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, as long as like, even if you just try to do something different, like even if you only have like one other thing that you do other than camming or other than stripping or other than sex work, um, if you even just use that across your platforms, that's going to get you more recognition and more popularity than the sex work. Um, And I think it's mainly because sex work is still kind of stigmatized, even online. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. 
So I think when you tell people like, hey, this is a different part of my personality that isn't part of this, people gravitate to that more because it's easier for them to almost digest. Yeah, I was just going to say that. Unfortunately, it's still like that. Okay, so I I see what you mean there. But you said something interesting there in terms of um, there's still stigma even with online sex work. Um, we, we know that sex work in all forms is highly, highly stigmatized. But how has been your experience? I, I would love for you to elaborate on that. Yeah, um, it's definitely gotten easier with OnlyFans, um, especially since OnlyFans has become, you know, so popular with girls going on there and, you know, showing their bits and tits. But <laughs> uh, it's still kind of hard to showcase, like, being a cam girl is not that far away from being an OnlyFans girl. You know, because it, um, being a cam girl, you don't have these companies getting commercials on Hulu and Netflix and Disney Plus and stuff. Whereas OnlyFans, because they kind of position themselves as a influencer platform, is able to do that. And it was able to blow up so fast. So more people kind of understand when you say that you're an OnlyFans girl. That like is nothing to people anymore. Right. Right. Like, do you think that with the popularity of sites like this, like an OnlyFans and subscription sites and even camming too, like it's becoming more mainstream. Do you think that in any way that will help destigmatize or do you think it already started that destigmatization piece already? Or do do you still think we have a long ways to go? I mean, I really hope so. I definitely think the pandemic in itself kind of helped catapult this into like a new age where people were just so bored that they didn't care anymore. You know, they don't care what you're doing. They just want to consume content. And so I think OnlyFans definitely paved a way for that to become easier and like pay-per-view sites in general to be easier to do. Um, But I will say that I do think that there's still like this weird aspect when you say that like you do online sex work if it's not OnlyFans because people are still kind of like, oh, that's weird, you know? Yeah. Talk about that more because like in terms of like – I know that we we spoke about like OnlyFans being like unso buzzy. Everyone knows what OnlyFans is, right? Um, But like, yeah, when you you shift the conversation to say – um, like different forms of like online sex work, whether it's camming or like doming and stuff like that, or even just even phone sex. People get weird about that too. Like, tell us about that in terms of like, have you experienced any of this at all? Like, if, I don't know if you want to share or not. Yeah, um, yeah, I'm totally okay with talking about it because I think it needs to be talked about more. You know, the more it becomes mainstream to talk about the easier it is for everybody else to share their experience too but um yeah I think that there's been a stigma against most of that stuff for like so long I mean think about like those old tv shows where like somebody would find out that the wife is a phone sex worker and then everybody in the neighborhood is like talking about her behind her back or I don't know if you've ever seen the show legion it's like no It's like when a bunch of people have like superpowers, but it's also like mental illness. So it's like if you had a mental illness and it was a superpower. Oh, what? Yeah, it's a really cool show. And in the show, there's this girl and her power is that she is like two different people. So like her regular self is like a normal girl. And then her split personality has superpowers. And in the show, she's a cam girl. And this is like in the 2000s. Okay. So it turns out that like she has to hide the fact that she's a cam girl from everybody because she has a son and because it's so like Mm. stigmatized to talk about. And so I think that that still carries on through the decades. Mm -hmm. But hopefully Mm -hmm. as people get more accustomed with like OnlyFans – they'll see like, oh, well, it's basically just live streaming, but sexy, which is all cam work is, which is all pretty much online 
porn, you know? Totally. Yeah. And I, I, I did an episode with one of my friends who's like a Twitch partner and I wanted to talk uh, about like, well, what is the difference between like live streaming and camming? Like I know one is sexy and we get naked, we do shows and stuff like that. But like, is there so much separation between the two? Because like, and I, I did a vote and there was like split. It was like, this is like, that's like definitely not sex work. But the way that some, I want to say mostly women, um, use it <laughs> in a way is highly sexualized. I've seen my girlfriend, Chloe, um, who's been pretty wholesome <laughs> the entire time. And she's hot. But I just see like the less clothing, like the clothing just like starting to come off even more. And I'm like, yeah, you go, girl. I love this shit. <laughs> But at the same time, like, where's the degree of separation there? Like, to me, it's uh, not exa- not a far cry from camming. Yeah, exactly. Like, I can't tell you how many times I've had people say, like, hey, you would be great at Twitch or you would be great at doing these other platforms. And because you can go on there in lingerie as long as you're covered up. So it's kind of like – these people are just watching you be nerdy while also being sexy. So again, it's just one of those like, Oh, another part of your personality, but then you're still hot, you know? Mm, Totally. Uh, One more thing too, on this topic as well. Nerdy. I feel like that's always like, I don't want to stereotype. There's always like the nerdy piece that goes with camming (laughs) a lot or very like girl next door ish kind of feel How do you feel about that? Like, is that a stereotype or like, is that just what people think automatically when they think cam model? I don't know. I actually don't. I didn't know that most people thought that, you know, nerdy was like generally a thing for cam girls. (laughs) Or maybe it's a genre. (laughs) Like, I don't know. Oh, like maybe. (laughs) But um, it does make sense, though, because when you are a cam girl, you have to learn so much about how to live stream, how to use OBS, how to use like all of these online tools that previously you had no idea about. So being nerdy kind of goes hand in hand with it because you have to be a little bit nerdy into get into all of this. Totally, totally. And sorry, we're bouncing back again. And this is like me just not being organized, but I'm actually not looking at my notes. So (laughs) this is what's happening. But like going with the nerdiness and the like just having to know so much stuff. um, I want to go back to the TikTok conversation too. um, In terms of like you navigating the app, we didn't talk about like how long it takes you to make these things because people think like, oh, TikTok, like I'm just going to make some video. I'm going to go viral. It's going to be great. But people don't realize how much hours and like time goes into making each video and each video is different but like what what has your experience been yeah um so it does take me probably like i mean every day pretty much i'm on tiktok so it'll take me at least like a week or two to really find the niche audios and whatever you know is popular and then in terms of like actually making the tiktok it could sometimes it only takes me five minutes other times it could take me like two hours because you know you have bloopers you don't do something right you know and another thing i've noticed is when you're making the tiktoks when you do something as soon as you do it save it to your drafts because even if you do that same tiktok a million times to get it perfect to be able to post you can still save those bloopers and use that as content like, oh my gosh, this is a blooper for later. Um, but yeah, sometimes it'll take me like an hour or two just to get it just right so that it looks perfect for posting. Smart. You know? Yeah, for sure. Um, one more thing here. Actually, like I know that we want to speak about this website that you're working on. And this is like a really bad transition because it's supposed to go with the last conversation. <laughs> but everyone asked earlier. But <laughs> Um, Can you tell us about um, the stream store, the streaming store that you're working on? 
<laughs> yeah. Um, so the streaming store is actually a website where streamers of all kinds, whether you're a TikToker, a YouTuber, an OnlyFans girl, a Twitch streamer, you can go onto this website and find all of the like best products that I've seen people use for these kind of things wow. and order them for yourself, especially if you're starting up or if you want like a better setup. Um, I'm creating this store so that you can go in almost like Amazon, search for what you want, you know, go get a better microphone, go get a better webcam, go get better lighting, go get a green screen, you know, whatever you may need will be on this store. But then it also won't be cluttered up like Amazon yeah. with a hundred different, you know, bedding and sheet options or like pet things, you know, yeah. you don't need all of yeah. that if you're just focus on your live stream stuff. That's awesome because like a lot of questions, um, at least with some of the other camming episodes that I've done dedicated to, ca ta dedicated to camming, um, they were like, oh, like, what's the best equipment to use? Or what is your setup? What kind of mic you use? What about the lighting? Like, what about your headset? What about your chair? Like, <laughs> there's a lot that goes into camming. And of course, like when you're first starting out, that stuff can be so overwhelming because there's so much stuff out there. Yeah, exactly. And I noticed that across a lot of these platforms, people use the like same equipment. It's mm. just a little bit different. Like somebody who's doing a Twitch stream may not need as much lighting as somebody who's doing like a YouTube video, mm -hmm. but you'll still need a really good microphone. Yes. You know? Yeah. There's so it's like, parallels. Parallels. yeah. So I wanted to really create like a drop shipping store that was able to host just what you need. Mm -hmm. And that's it. Wow. This is like such a genius idea. And I'm surprised that no one's done it. So like kudos to you. That's a huge project to take on. Like how long have you been working on this for? Thanks. Um, I've been working on it for probably about like five months now just to make sure that like everything was put together. Um, I actually learned how to create a drop shipping store in this process, which was a lot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, it is. It's a lot. <laughs> yeah. But I'm really excited because I think moving forward as the store like goes live, I think we're going to start doing more projects where like we do YouTube videos or TikTok videos showing how to decorate your room with the things from the store. So it'll give people like ideas for like, hey, I want to do this. This is how I would do it with this store's products. That is so freaking cool. Like, I mean, there's obviously been like, there's a, been a need for this in the industry, which you identified. Like, when did you notice that this was something that was like, we need this, we need this store instead of like spending hours on Amazon or wherever site that you get to your stuff. Like, that's so genius. <laughs> <laughs> I actually had like an epiphany kind of when I was doing an interview on my YouTube channel and somebody was talking about, oh, well, if I want something for my cam room, I go to this Amazon wish list that's like shared. It's like cam girl Amazon. And it's like all things for like cam girls. And I was like, well, what if you had that just like on its own website? And then I started thinking like, I bet other streamers probably need the same thing for everything they do. You know, just yes. suggestions of like, I have no idea what I'm doing. I'm just starting. So now where do I buy exactly what I need? You know? So I was like, okay, well, I'm going to try to figure this out. And then I went on and I just started Googling, you know? And I was just like, okay, well, the best way I'm going to figure this stuff out is just through Google. So I was like, okay, I'm just going to learn. And then over the few months that I was learning, I was putting it together. And then I was like showing my friends and my friends were like, oh, this is a good idea, which kind of made me think like, okay, maybe it is a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> Some good validation there for sure. That's awesome. And like, well, I think this episode is going to be coming out in early May. I'm assuming and hoping that the site should be up by then. And I'll be plugging that link down below. Are you able to share? Uh, we'll, we'll, able, we'll, we'll share the link at the very end of the show, which is coming soon. But um, I would love for everyone to go peep that, especially like 
especially if you're you are considering camming and this is like a, an area or avenue that you want to venture down upon or maybe you are already a cam girl or cam model or maybe you are trying OnlyFans, like live streaming there or wherever. Just take a peep at it because this sounds like super, super helpful and this would help a lot of people. So super awesome. Thank you for that. And I forgot to even talk about your YouTube channel as well, which we can briefly go into too because I did watch a couple of videos and they're super helpful. Um, did you want to speak a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, my YouTube channel is just basically like I do interviews with people who are in the industry, business leaders in the industry. Um, and then I also do like interviews with like new cam girls to see what's happening kind of in the world of camming. Um, and then I also do tips and tricks on there for, you know, niche projects or like I just did a collab video about how to do your own milk bath photo oh. shoot at home. Cool. So cool. Yeah, we kind of just do everything and anything that's dedicated towards camming or insider tips to camming is all on my YouTube channel. Which is amazing because like, you know, back in the day, like they, there weren't resources like this or like yourself. So I think it's great that you are doing this and it's something that's so accessible, especially on YouTube. And YouTube has its own like <laughs> tricky things. And because I have a YouTube channel too that's not sex work related, but if you anyone wants to check it out, it's C.S. Lerbs. I do noodles. Um, <laughs> but yeah, because like, YouTube is also tricky to navigate as well. So, but I mean, if you're just sharing some resources, tips and tricks and stuff, then I don't think you'd be violating any terms. But yeah. I get flagged a lot, but you know, whatever. It's fine. <laughs> it, it is what it is, right? <laughs> we do have a few questions here at the end of the show. I think we should probably venture off into that section if that's cool with you, Emily. Yeah, cool. Um, and we'll also add one of my questions that we didn't get into because I just don't want to do a weird transition back to that. So, <laughs> um, first question from the audience here. Um, will the rise of your popularity on TikTok change the style of the content you show as a sex worker? That question is really good. Um. Mm, super good. Thank you, Gleagle Smash, for sending that in. <laughs> um, I do definitely see um, the more popular I get on TikTok, uh, I do kind of get a little bit more conservative in my cam room um, because I see that a lot of people are coming to see me get naked or see me use toys because it's like, oh, I saw you on TikTok. I want to see you get naked and do weird stuff. And so I become a little bit more conservative because of course that like hook is really the important part, that teasing, that alluding to I'm going to get naked soon. Um, so I usually only do the more explicit stuff like at the end of my show or in a ticket show, which is like hidden only if you pay. Um, so I definitely saw myself getting more conservative as I got more popular on TikTok because I didn't need to hook people in with me being naked. They were already hooked by finding me on social media. Wow, that's a yeah, that's a little bit of a shift too. And I, I was gonna, I was gonna ask about that too. I was like, oh, I can't wait till we ask this like later on air because I was like, oh, this is so interesting. Think that's such a great, great question. Um, I wonder if other sex workers are also like going through similar things too, if they're offering that or if they have like large TikTok followings or whatnot. So, like if they're also. I wouldn't say shying away, but maybe in a way it is kind of like shying away because you're becoming like more conservative that way. But yeah, fascinating, fascinating. Um, I did have a question about that too. Yeah, now it's gone, but never mind. <laughs> never mind. If it comes back to me, I'll ask, but it was something in relation to that. But yeah, I mean, do you – like as a trend, do you think that you would ever like – stop counting at all or is this just going to be like and this is just a random thought for me like if it's becoming more and more conservative like is this something that you think you're going to stop at some point I don't know um I don't really like have any plans on stopping like I know some cam models who have been doing it 
for 18 plus years. Wow. And then I know, yeah. And then I know some Kim models who are like, yeah, I did it for like six, seven years. And then I just stopped and I started living like a completely different life. Yeah. I've so those too. I personally don't have any plans on like stopping, but at the same time, I also think that big, bigger projects and like businesses that happen sometimes happen. So while I, I know that camming is my number one, you know, platform, and I would probably never give it up easily, but I also don't want to say never because life happens. Yeah, life happens, exactly. And you never know what kind of opportunities are going to present itself to you. And of course, like, you know, as we change, like I've definitely gone through different phases myself. Like I want to stop sugaring because I wanted to not do that anymore because I wasn't being true to who I who I was and I wanted to have a relationship and I just I wouldn't be comfortable doing that personally for me. Some people are totally fine with doing that. That's fine. But like we go through different life stages too. And I think it's important to just be true to yourself, like whether or not this is going to be a good fit for you right now and like maybe not a good fit for you later. So and that's something you have to just acknowledge within yourself. Um, the second question here from any is what is your response to people who accuse sex workers of being irresponsible for using a kid friendly app to sell sex? I would say that every social media app is open to everybody in the world. It's all worldwide. So it's not that this social media app is exclusively for children or anything. Mm -hmm. We do understand that, you know, all ages use it, but it's also not our job to figure out who's watching our videos. We make videos because we want to make videos on social media. TikTok itself has guidelines and removes videos and flags people for what it deems to be appropriate or not appropriate. And also kids have parents who can monitor that kind of stuff. But us as creators aren't really responsible for somebody who doesn't want their child watching our videos. You know, all of these apps are just open to the public. Mm -hmm. So it's not really, you know, up to us who's watching. Yeah, I was going to say that too, because it's not your responsibility to, to police who is consuming your content. Uh, people also need to be responsible for how they consume content as well, whether it's your children, whether it's yourself. Because for me, I am that person that gets like freaking lost in scrolling for like two hours. And I'm like, oh, my God, where'd the time go? And that's <laughs> – I think we're all, a lot of us are really guilty of that for sure. <laughs> um, I had a, a tangent question, but – and just because I don't know. But you know how there's shadow banning on, on Instagram – is there shadow banning on TikTok as well or, or just – um, I don't think so. Um, as the, like, app progresses, um, it's kind of like the Wild West out here. Um, <laughs> like, you can pretty much get away with a lot or not get shadow banned for a lot of stuff um, because it doesn't have the capability to do that yet. But, of course, as these apps and as their developers earn more money – from the app itself, they're able to put more technology into it, which is able to do things like shadow ban, you know, Instagram's owned by Facebook, which of course has a lot of money. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and TikTok is kind of coming into its own in that sort of right. So you're kind of just out here doing whatever you want until the law comes and cracks down on you, you know? Totally. Yeah. Like that brings me to a point like in terms of like, well, with Instagram, like when the algorithm just changed or like the way that your feed, it wasn't like chronological anymore. It's just like whatever was like more views or whatever, or whatever the algorithm wanted to push that day is <laughs> like up on your feed. So yeah, I mean – I don't want to see you're at the mercy of the developers, <laughs> but you're kind of at the mercy of the, of the developers too. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Just have to continue. I would that. say, I would definitely say that if you're going to do like any of these social platforms, um, something that I wish I would have done sooner is making more than one account, um, making a backup at account that you like tell people like, Hey, if my account ever gets deleted, this is my backup account. It has most of the same stuff, but a little bit different. 
you know, and that way people can like still follow you. And then if your other account gets like banned or deleted, you can still rely on that one and not have to start from zero. Yeah. Yeah. And that goes across like all platforms pretty much where sex workers are not supported. So, which is a lot of them. So, yeah. <laughs> Um, there's a couple questions here that I missed earlier because, again, I wasn't looking at my notes. I was just jiving and vibing with everything today, which is awesome. <laughs> um, I guess it's technically two questions. So um, how can TikTok be used as a way to help destigmatize sex work is the first one. Um, maybe we can just quickly answer that. And then I have another question for you after this. Yeah, um, I would say the more that you make it normal, you know, the more that you present yourself as a normal person, and this is just what you do for work, the better, because the more normal you make it instead of like, it being weird, then the more that other people are going to recognize it as normal and then just move on with their day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well put. Well said. And we, we definitely touched on that earlier. So thank you for that. And last question for me. So how do you feel about the misinformation or glamorization of sex work on TikTok? And if you need examples, I can definitely let you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I would love to hear some examples. Yeah. So like I've definitely seen some TikToks and I, I can't name any like accounts or anything, but just st stuff that I've seen over the past year about like sugar babies um, on TikTok. And I just feel like more personal with that because I was a sugar baby before, but just kind of um, really stretching stories um, because their accounts have amount like a large amount of followers that they're really glamorizing the industry I've also seen that with some stripper talks as well just really glamorizing the work too and just forgetting that hey there's an actual work component to this industry as well um those are just a couple examples that I've seen um and I'm just curious to see how you felt on that yeah no that definitely makes sense um Kind of like how people would talk about Instagram um, influencers, like back in the day when people would be like glamorizing this influencer lifestyle and then people would try it and be like, well, it didn't work for me. And it's like, well, yeah, because there's actually like a whole thing behind it. Like you actually have to do the work. Um, and I completely understand what you mean when you say that they're like glorifying the industry. Um Part of me thinks it's a little bit dangerous in the way of like these impressionable girls who go and try to be like a sugar baby and then end up in like a dangerous situation because they don't understand that there's a lot more that goes into it than just what they see online. But another part of me is like, um, I do kind of understand why some people try to glamorize it in that kind of way because they want the views and they want people to follow them. You yeah, know? This, is, this is exactly the point that I was getting to too. So like where yeah. is that line? Like where is the balance in that? Because sometimes it it, can, it really fluctuates, right? Especially when it's like yeah. a business. I honestly think the best thing that people can do is like – what I don't understand is why the people that like have these accounts that talk about it, why they don't also like educate people mm -hmm. like you can gl like glamorize it and glamorize your life and like be that kind of like, oh, my life is so awesome and amazing, <laughs> you know, but then also have like a video or two talking about like, hey, this is like behind the scenes of my life or hey, this is how you can be safe while you're doing this, you know. You can have that duality, especially on platforms like TikTok and stuff, because like we were saying earlier, people want to see the real you. So when you talk about that stuff, it helps other people and it helps people like you more anyway. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. There's definitely – yeah, I'm so torn on that topic because <laughs> like, I, I just feel like is there is there a degree of responsibility that – as creators that we need to partake in. But at the same time, again, as I said earlier, we're not responsible for who consumes our content. Like, which is why, like, I feel like there should be some degree of like education. I, I just really firmly believe there has to be education all around with everything. So, so yeah, but 
Awesome, awesome, awesome answer. <laughs> but Emily, before I let you go, where can we find you? Um, I mean, you can always just Google Emily Jones chat and I pop up, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm on Twitter at MJ Bird. I'm at MJ Bird on OnlyFans, at MJ.Bird on Instagram, um, and Emily Jones chats on YouTube. Other than that, emilyjones.godaddysites.com is my website. And the streamingstore.com should be up soon. And you guys can also check out some cool features that I'll be doing for the website there. Awesome. Emily, it was so fun chatting with you on this super insightful episode all about TikTok. I feel like maybe I can like try to do this again, like for my third attempt, but we'll see. We'll see about that. <laughs> We're totally going to make you into like a whole glamorized cam girl by the end of it. It's going to be amazing. <laughs> <laughs> For everyone else listening, don't forget it's Strip by Sia on all podcast platforms, Strip by Sia on Twitter, Strip by Sia on Instagram. Hopefully by this time, my new website will be out. Now I can finally announce it because I've been working hard on it and just flip flopping and it's just not fun, but it will be up soon. So that like four seasons in, I'm probably having an official website. <laughs> that will be up soon. Uh, don't forget to like, rate, share, review, and subscribe. I would love to read whatever thoughts or feedback, good or bad, um, on Apple reviews. Um, Spotify has a rating system now as well. And of course, if you want to help support the show, it's patreon.com slash strip by Sia. And we'll catch everyone in for another episode next Sunday. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, Sia. Bye. 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 listening to Stripped by Sia, hosted, produced, and edited by Steph Sia, music by Ted D, graphic design by Maria Bellandorama, and photography by Ian Davern.